all the sound equipment on and everything. I think we should be good to go now. Okay, so welcome back. Another week in the books. We have a few more left for this year. 2022 is fastly, quickly coming to a close. Uh, but it's always good to have this fellowship. And I appreciate everybody who's coming in here to study how to be successful in spiritual warfare. Right, so this is a very important topic because it's something that we are always involved in. You will not face a moment of any day at any point where you are not involved in spiritual warfare because our enemy is relentless and he is always on the prowl. So that's one of the things that we talked about and we will continue to dive into tonight. So let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and then we'll dive into the lesson. Holy Father, we come to you at this time just giving thanks for allowing us once again to come together and gather in your son's name. We just pray, Father, that you will watch over us and help us to clear our mind as we dive into your word. Uh, Father, please just continue to help these things to be a uh, blessing to us. And we pray that we may soak it in and not just be hearers of your word, but also to be doers of your word so that we can be found as effective soldiers for Christ. It is in his holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive back in. We are continuing on chapter 8 of this particular topic, which is movement and development of troops, becoming a skilled warrior. We know how important it is to not only be involved in spiritual warfare, as I just stated, but if you're gonna be in the war, you might as well have a few skills out here on this battlefield. We don't wanna go out here being ill-equipped, we don't want to be bait for the enemy, and we don't wanna be in a position to where uh, we find ourselves losing, right? Being a casualty of war. Now there's an ultimate casualty if at the end of this life you are not uh, solid and secure with your relationship with Christ, then you lose the entire war. And that we certainly want to avoid. But then not only do you have the entire war, you also have the daily battles. So for many of us, the war is not in question because we have already given our lives to Christ. He is already our general, our leader, and our captain. And we can say that we are secure in salvation through him. So you got the war down. But what about those daily battles? All right, so we can be victorious in the war, but you can be getting your butt kicked all up and down the field in this everyday life, and we don't wanna be in that type of situation. We don't wanna be in a situation where Satan is continually devouring us and taking bites out of our legs, so we're gonna be wise soldiers so that we can win our daily battles as much as possible. And that's part of what this study dives into. Once you get these skills and these strategies and these techniques, and you start to apply them and implement them, you will find yourself living a more abundant life, which is what Jesus would have us to live. The more abundant life really starts with winning these battles that Satan is going to throw your way. And when we can become victorious, then we live the way that he wants us to live. So as a quick recap, we'll kind of go through and talk about what we touched on last week. Uh, we opened up really talking about wisdom because we're talking about mastering our weapons. All right, so any good soldier understands their weapons in and out, and you don't want to just be casual with your weapons, but you want to be a master of your weapons. You want to understand all the nuances and all the little nooks and crannies. Sometimes I watch these war movies, and you'll see where they can just disassemble an entire rifle, right? And it's all these small pieces, and then put it back together. And then the drill sergeant will time them on this to make sure that they can do it within a certain amount of time. You have to be so intimately connected with your weapon that you can take it apart into all its pieces and put it back together again and have it fully functional. That's knowing the ins and outs of your weapon. So when we come down to the ins and outs of our spiritual weapons, we want to know them and be intimate with them and understand them. And the first one we touched on last week was wisdom. So when we uh, touch on wisdom, we talk about practicing because that's the only way you're gonna become competent at anything is to do it. One of the reasons that some of us are so good at sinning in certain ways is because we do it a lot. <laughs> you know, if you practice sin, you become a master of sin. All right, if you practice righteousness, you become a master of righteousness. So we wanted to take a look in wisdom, right, and see, uh, we kind of went to 1 Samuel 17, and we took a look at David's story in David and Goliath. And in that scenario, um, we saw where he practiced and mastered his weapon. So David did not try to go to war with weapons that he had not mastered, which was one of the aspects of wisdom that was beneficial for him. Saul, King Saul, took war weapons, traditional stuff, right? Swords, armor, all the stuff that people use in battle and put it on David and said, if you're gonna go and fight Goliath, wear my stuff. 
David said, I have not mastered these weapons. I don't understand these weapons. I'm not going to take this stuff with me. He took the weapons that he had mastered, which was wise. And then he also used wisdom to take an unconventional approach to warfare. How many times have you read or seen in the history of warfare where somebody went out there with a staff and a slingshot? This is the only instance I've ever seen in anything like that. You see arrows, you see swords, you see uh, cannons. You know, in modern war, we see guns and AR-16s and all kinds of things, right? Even out to missiles and bombs. Who in their right mind would go with a staff and a sling and expect to be victorious? But that's where he was unconventional approach to warfare. And he had to use wisdom from the Lord in order to take that approach. So that's what we want to do. We want to be wise and use an unconventional approach whenever we can. Um, so we saw that Goliath came with his weapon, and I underlined with here, Goliath came with a weapon. However, David came in his weapon because he told Goliath, you're coming at me with swords. I am coming at you in the name of the Lord. So it's more powerful to come at somebody in a weapon than it is to go with a weapon. And I used an example last week of somebody who comes to you with a robot arm. Let's say they're gonna, we're gonna fight, right? And you're gonna have a robotic bionic arm. That robot arm is very powerful and it can swing and knock down somebody. I'm not gonna be able to really do anything with you if you come fight me with a robot arm if I'm just in my normal you know, human flesh. But if I come to you inside of a mech, and a mech is a giant robot fighting machine, I am now at the advantage and you don't have a chance because it's not me who's doing fighting, it's the mech. You have to fight against this robot that I am inside of. So when I go into spiritual warfare in the name of the Lord, I am not fighting by my own power, not by my might or by my strength, but by God's spirit. I am fighting in this battle. And that's how we have to take our approach if we expect to be successful. So with that, uh, our base text for this particular chapter was 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, which is a familiar text for many of us, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And the reason I keyed in on this particular scripture is because when it comes down to spiritual warfare, that is our weapon, the word of God. When you read through Ephesians chapter six, we see that uh, the only semblance of an offensive weapon that we do have is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All scripture is profitable for all of these different types of things. So we want to examine our weapon, we want to use our weapon and understand our weapon and how we're gonna go about it. Now, we're gonna hit the second point because last week we really uh, touched on wisdom and then we talked about wisdom and prudence and how they dwell together. So, tonight we're gonna to start with mastering your weapons, prudence, all right? Prudence is the next thing. Now when it came down to prudence, it's very interesting because prudence is something that we see but it's not something that we always pay a lot of attention to. But Proverbs 8.12 says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. And we sort of explored that last week, talking about how the idea to use a sling or rather a projectile weapon, when somebody's coming up in a melee fight, right? Projectile just simply means it's a distance weapon. I'm gonna use a distance weapon when my enemy is expecting me to come in and do battle melee. Right? Melee is like hand-to-hand -hand type combat. That was witty. That's a witty thing for David to try to do. Because if David, David had fought the enemy on the enemy's terms, David would have died that day. The wisdom from God that David got from the Lord gave him the idea to take a different approach. We don't have to fight the enemy on the enemy's terms. And that's something that we really need to keep in mind as we live this life. Satan is going to try his best to get you to use his weapons, fight him his way, fight on his terms, we do not have to do it. We have weapons that are not of this world. We're not gonna use carnality to try to win in spiritual warfare. We're gonna use wisdom that we get from God. So, when we talk about wisdom, and Solomon in Proverbs chapter eight really personifies wisdom. In the beginning, he talks about how she calls out 
from the city gates, how she is at the top yelling down to men, trying to get us to come to her. She says, I got everything you need. I was with the Lord at the foundation of the world. You have to understand, God put me here for your benefit. So wisdom is calling out, and we know how helpful wisdom can be to us. But something really jumped out that we took a look at last week, and that's that wisdom dwells with prudence. They're roommates. Wisdom and prudence live in the same house together. And for a lot of us, that was sort of a revelation because we didn't really see it that way before, right? We, we sort of see that prudence in there and just kind of skip over it. All the focus always goes to wisdom. So here's the way we normally are. Because when it comes down to wisdom dwelling with prudence, we kind of ignore prudence as uh, not really being a part of the conversation. You can see in this image, right? There's us and then there's wisdom. And we're having this conversation and we come up and we talk to wisdom and we want to congregate with wisdom and we just kind of forget about lonely old prudence sitting over there to the side. This is common courtesy. You should have wisdom and prudence together. One of the things my mom taught me as she tried to instill values into her son is that when you walk into a room and there's two people, speak to everybody in the room. I remember when she was picking me up from school as a youngster, I would get in the car and my mom would be on other things and she said, get out. I had to get out the car and I already knew. So I stepped back in, hey mom, <laughs> gotta speak, common courtesy. So many of us approach wisdom and we just in love with it. We wanna talk about wisdom, we wanna get all the wisdom in the world. Wisdom and prudence live in the same house and we ignore prudence, it's just rude. How do we walk in a room and speak to wisdom and not speak to prudence? So tonight, we're going to take a look at this uh, sort of unwelcome housemate that we sort of overglance all the time, and that's prudence. Let's take a look at prudence and see what we can find out about prudence, because they dwell together, which means that they have a lot of similarities, they have a lot of characteristics, and it's something that we should pay attention to as well. We want to make sure that we are prudent people. Now, when it comes down to wisdom, um, last week sort of turned into a bit of a Bible study because we took a look at some Bible study tools. And I showed you how I will dive into uh, the original languages. And uh, there's a particular app called the Blue Letter Bible, which is a very easy to use app. And you can go into that and you can start to dive into word studies and definitions. So I pulled this because when we start talking about wisdom, you need to define what wisdom is. Wisdom, when you think of that word, it can take you to a lot of places because we think about some things that are just high and mighty and in the clouds and I have divine wisdom and if I close my eyes and meditate, maybe wisdom will come to me. We sort of think of wisdom a lot of different ways, but at the end of the day, here's the way the Bible defines wisdom, skill. Wisdom is simply skill, okay? So keep that in the back of your mind. When it comes down to wisdom and we want to acquire wisdom, we need to acquire skill. Now. When we do the word study on prudence, we will see that uh, the way that prudence is used in the Old Testament in this passage has to do with craftiness, craftiness, okay? So when we start talking about wisdom and prudence, we're talking about skill and we're talking about craftiness. So the wisdom that I'm supposed to get from this passage that wisdom and prudence dwell together is that I need a combination of both skill and craftiness. You love to talk about skill, but what about craftiness? We need to be able to use them together. Now with that craftiness, it can sometimes have a negative connotation, but of course we're gonna use it in a positive way. Prudence, at the end of the day, is the ability to exercise skill in a clever way. Exercising skill in a clever way. And that's what we saw from David when it came down to physical warfare. When he was facing this giant of Goliath in his life, he needed to exercise skill in a clever way. So let's take a look at that. When it comes down to exercising skill, all right, sling. I put on the uh, screen an image that you might come across your head when you think about a sling. All right, a sling, you have a little pouch and you can put a rock in there, it's got a rope in it, so you can kind of you know, swing it around and throw it out, hit your target, and then you're all good. That requires skill. I don't know how many of you grew up playing with slings. You know, it's not something that our kids use a lot of times these days, 
But if you ever get a chance, and I think I played with one for a while, and I put it down, because I was like, I can't do anything. I can't do anything with this. It takes some skill to be able to use a sling. It was no fun for me as a child trying to play with a sling because it was too hard. <laughs> it was too hard. It was, so, it was much easier to just pick up like a little pellet gun or something else. Okay, so it requires skill to be able to use a sling. Remember, skill equals wisdom. Now, what else did David take when he went to go fight Goliath? He took his staff. And we saw that in the text. It says he picked up his staff, the sling, and five smooth stones. Now, there's a, a type of a sling called a staff sling. And that's when you have your staff and you just tie this, as you can see on the screen, uh, the string and the pouch around it. And when you use a staff sling, you can put a rock in there and you can use the staff to then wind up and launch it. Okay? So two different ways. Both of these are effective. They both work. But there's something about the staff sling. It has some unique properties and characteristics because if you go up to warfare with a staff, you can conceal your intentions with a staff sling. I'll have that little sling on there and Goliath's from a distance and I'm a shepherd, so I'm walking up with my staff and Goliath has really no idea that the sling is actually there. I can conceal my intentions. He doesn't know that I'm bringing a gun to a knife fight. What does that require? Prudence. Prudence to use a staff sling. Another thing about the staff sling is it gives you more power. When you're using a regular sling, as opposed to a staff sling, the staff sling can get at least two times more power. Because you can take a staff sling and throw a rock up to 100 miles per hour, which is fast enough to break through any bones. You don't get that same kind of power with a hand sling. Prudence, all right? So we can see in physical warfare, David needed a little bit of prudence, the ability to exercise wisdom over his skill and to do the skillful thing, or the wise thing, rather, in a skillful way. So when I'm using the staff sling and I'm going up and I'm getting ready to approach and face my giants, it's going to give me uh, this dichotomy because choosing a sling was wise, but choosing a staff sling is prudent. Can you discern the difference between these two? Wisdom, prudence dwell together. They are so similar, they're so tightly knit that you can barely even tell the difference between the two. They kind of remind me of identical twins. If you were to say identical twins live together, there are differences because identical twins are two different people. They have two different minds, two different intentions, but they have so many similarities. Look-wise, personality-wise, you'll often see identical twins that look the same. I look at wisdom and I look at prudence kind of like that. They go together, but we have to recognize the nuances because there is a difference and there's a way that we can use prudence to our benefit. So I want to take a look at a, a scripture here. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, uh, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So we're talking about Christ using wisdom and prudence to make his grace abound towards us. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. David used wisdom and prudence in his battle against Goliath. We want to learn how to use wisdom and prudence in our spiritual battles that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we see that Christ used both wisdom and prudence in order to lavish the riches of his grace on us, I want us to sort of get together and discuss this particular point. So I'm kind of looking around. Um, Y'all sort of section off according to kind of where you are, all right? So I want to just have a, a little five-minute sort of breakout. And we normally don't do this in the, the larger rooms. This is one of the things that I like doing in the smaller classrooms. Uh, but I want you to, you know, try to participate as best you can, okay? And here's the question. As you guys come together and you start thinking about the responses, answer this. How did Christ use 
wisdom and prudence to shower his grace upon us. I want you to think about that and start talking about how. How did he actually carry this out? We're told that he did it. He showered his grace upon us with wisdom and prudence. What are some of the ways? What are the methods? What did he do? How did he carry this out? So just generate some thoughts. Take five minutes and group up amongst yourselves, sort of kind of wherever you're sitting. You know, turn around and talk to your neighbor. And uh, we'll come back through. All right. So I love the fact that we got discussions going, and I, I hear it's very, uh, you know, very animated, and it's going. This is good. This is beautiful. So we're going to go ahead and, and get started. I want to make sure that I uh, get some feedback from every group. So little Charles is going to start over on this side of the room and nominate somebody in your group to be the kind of the group spokesperson and summarize some of the thoughts. So we're going to go around the room and sort of get the collective wisdom. So we'll start with this kind of back corner on my right. Kobe, everybody's pointing at you. Now they're pointing at Chris. <laughs> All right, Kobe got the mic, go ahead. All right, so the question is, how did Christ use wisdom and prudence to really shower or lavish his grace upon us? I can't. Oh, you might just hold it back a little bit. Uh, yeah, um, well, in our group, me and him, uh, the word grace kind of hung us up a little bit because uh, we didn't know if it was like, um, Usually when you hear grace, it's something you don't deserve. So when you were talking about um, showering it upon us, mm -hmm. we were almost thinking, you know, his wisdom and prudence, you can't just, you can't just keep coming back for it. And we started talking about um, different things, but with the prudence aspect, you know, you almost have to, I feel like earn was a bad word, but um, because it is grace, but almost you have to earn it. You have to be striving towards God. You can't just be out here doing what you want to do, expecting grace. So that's where we were at. All right. Appreciate that. Right. Go ahead and go back to Brother James. And... <laughs> okay. When, when we looked at, um, we looked at verses 7 through, through 9, and so... We went back to verse number seven and, and took a good look at verse number seven because in verse number seven, it really speaks of the crucifixion of Christ. Mm -hmm. And since it speaks of the crucifixion of Christ, when you think of crucifixion, you, you, you're thinking in terms of the fact that somebody died, some blood was shed, and, and other than Christ, no one else was resurrected from a crucifixion. But when you look at God's wisdom, and his prudence using skill, the skill of God, and the cleverness of God is embedded in the cross itself. Yeah. Because Satan thought he had Jesus where he wanted him, but yet the, the cross was God's clever design to redeem us and to restore us back into a relationship with him. Beautiful. Little Charles, drop the mic. No, I don't do it for you. <laughs> yeah. That was a mic drop moment. All right. So he talked about the wisdom. Okay, again, wisdom being skill. Christ had to have the skill to go to that cross. And he had to be in a position where he could do it for all mankind. As much as I love you guys, I couldn't go to the cross for you. I got my own sin problems. Christ had to have the skill and then the cleverness, as he talked about. The cleverness of the prudence was that Satan thought he had him. In that grave, three days down, but then he got up. The cleverness of being able to use a tool of death to bring life. Oh, that's that prudence when it comes out. Beautifully stated. Thank you, sir. All right. Next group. Yes, one of our answers was stolen by <laughs> Brother Keith. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, mic drop right. again. <laughs> that's all right. No, the other, the other thing we discussed was how Christ used uh, how he dealt with his disciples with wisdom and prudence, teaching them. And uh, the other thing we talked about was the woman at the well. 
how wisdom improves with the woman as well. Scoot a little closer so we can. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. It. So we talked about how Christ used wisdom and prudence with his disciples okay. in teaching them. We also mentioned about uh, the woman at the well when Christ used wisdom and prudence with the woman at the well. Excellent example. I appreciate that. All right, so let's come on around. Who's the, uh, raise your hand if you're representative from this group. Okay. Um, kind of piggybacking off of over there a little bit, but uh, uh, when I looked at the word wisdom, uh, like you said, skill, I was thinking along the lines of Christ providing the opportunity, like you said, going to the cross for us to have a way into the kingdom, mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's the skill. And then the prudence, the craftiness of it um, is that we have a way to get there through him, we just have to take that through baptism. So that's kind of the, if you want to use that word sneaky as we most think of it, but craftiness is that it's not just there, you have to do something. There's a step you have to take um, uh, to receive that grace that right. he showered us with. Beautiful, beautifully stated. Thank you for that. And that sort of goes to, and raise your hand if you're the next group right here. Um, it goes back to what we talked about a few weeks ago. We shared an example of Naaman. And there was a little bit of craftiness involved in how he was going to get his healing and his cleansing. Right? And he sort of missed it because <laughs> of the cleverness of it. Uh, but God has these mysterious ways. He has sort of these crafty ways. And he uses prudence with us all the time. All right. Group on the back row. Uh, we talked about the day of Pentecost. Uh, seeing God's wisdom displayed through... God allowing them to speak in different languages, mm. to communicate to everyone that was present, to get the church started, spread the gospel, and accomplish everything that he wanted to in that moment. Another beautiful example. The skill of the Holy Spirit, which Christ promised to those who would be there in that moment. But then the craftiness, because when they first heard them speak, they said, these men are drunk in the middle of the day. They missed the message. God used the craftiness of miraculous languages to go ahead and get his word out. Beautiful example. All right, Jack? Um, we talked about, we talked about the woman at the well, but you know, we'll forego that one since it was already mentioned. Um, we also talked about how uh, Christ spoke in parables, just the skill of just being able to communicate um, and the prudence of being able to communicate with the lay person so that everybody could could understand. Um, and then the other thing we kind of talked about was the Tower of Babel, um, just the the skill of, okay, yes, let me let me shut this down before it before they ruin themselves, and the craftiness of not annihilating man at that moment. Yeah, excellent, excellent examples. This is why I wanted y'all to huddle up. These are good, right? So those are two. Phenomenal examples when you talk about the Tower of Babel, where God could have just destroyed everybody for going about their own way. But he came up with a crafty solution in order to stop man from glorifying himself. Very good. All right, Francine. Well, I just want to say, first of all, I am surrounded by wisdom and prudence here because I got nominated to talk. <laughs> um, a lot of the examples that were already given, of course, we, we spoke to those things as well. But just the shock and awe that Christ would use whenever he would deal with people during that time, the traditional time that he was in, he was not supposed to mingle with those that were not Jewish. And what he did was, but as he dealt with those people, it was a shock. And he did that intentionally. So we talked about a lot of those examples of how he dealt with people who were sinners. And those, and those examples are even true now, how we deal with sinners and how we deal with interacting with one another. Another good one. Appreciate that. Up here to this group. Yeah, Christ used, uh, a lot of words translate, right, for that alma. That's what it is uh, in Hebrew when we talk about craftiness, shrewdness, cunningness, right? So there's a lot of different words and they all kind of fit. And sometimes they can have a negative connotation, but when you use it in this positive way, we see that Christ used a lot of craftiness in the way that he dealt with people and approached people. We talked about the fact that 
that the, that when we sin, that the wages of sin is death, meaning that that we needed a way out. So the wisdom was that Christ would go to the cross and die for the sins of us. And the prudence was the fact that when we discover in the book of John, well, first John chapter one, verse seven, the Bible says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of his son cleanses us from all sins, which is a continuation. So he fixed it so that even after he died and we still continue to sin, if we walk in the light, that blood that he shed way back then will cleanse us until we meet with him. Yeah, yeah, excellent insight. And Christ had the all... skill. <laughs> No, this lady right here, y'all, <laughs> she is the bomb. <laughs> All right, Kendall, appreciate that. All right, Christ had the skill to go to the cross and the wisdom, the prudence, and the insight to know that this is going to need to be something that will continue to work over and over and over again. Beautifully done. All right, no, I see you rolling your eyes. <laughs> Charles. Somebody, raise your hand. We could go, but... Um... All right. Us back here. <laughs> so, but, I mean, we agree with most of the comments that were said. We talked about the lady at the well, as also about just using uh, parables in the Bible just to teach to the layman. There's so many stories that in order to get, to make sure a person understand, God went to the simplicity of man to get the story over to us, just like being the church in being married to the church, he compared it to, to God being, you know, to the marriage. Uh, the church is his bride. And people may not understand why he died for the church, but what you die for your bride is simplicity of everything. Beautiful. All right, Sister Frankie, appreciate that. All right, Brother Sam is there, so he looks like he's got a bunch of words. Mm -hmm. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, every, everybody, everything that everyone said, we pretty much agree with and talked about that. So in an effort not to say the same thing over again, um, yeah, so in an effort not to say the same thing over again, basically, I think God's wisdom is um, his word. Mm -hmm. it, it's quite simply his word and the prudence uh, or the craftiness that he uses is each and every one of us to be the mode of communication to help each other with that. All right. So, yeah, it's the wisdom of God's word. Absolutely. All right, Sister Gina, I'm going to pick on you. Yeah. <laughs> I was in this group. Oh, were you? Okay, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. Come on up. And we got this section here. All right. Well, it seems like everybody got big radar ears, but that's what we hung our hats on as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that God had addressed most of us or most of the people in the Bible through parable so that we could easily understand what he was trying to get, you know, how he got our attention without throwing arrows and, and, and lightning bolts and stuff, but sat down gracefully, showed us the error of our ways, our earthly ways, and then showed us how we could, you know, circumvent the sins that we were committing and, and fix things. You know, like, you know, sitting in the sand drawn with his finger, uh, you know, talking to the lady who was accused of adultery. Mm -hmm. um, let the first person, you know, who's without sin, cast the first stone. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was his way of, of, of skillfully yeah. telling everybody around that you know better than anybody else standing here. The grace came in when he told the lady to look up, where are your accusers? Right, right. Now go your way and, and sin no more. That was, that was the ultimate grace for her. Right. But he kind of does the same thing over and over and over and over again until some of us with thick heads get the message. Another excellent example, right? The, the craftiness and the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom to know that she's guilty under the law. And the wisdom to not tell them that y'all don't have the right to stone her because they did. But then the prudence kicks in and says, well, if you want to stone her, let the first one with no sin cast it. And by the way, he would have been the only person who could pick up a stone in that audience, which is why he was the only one left. <laughs> and he chose not to pick up the stone, but instead chose to enhance her 
to get her going along again. His job was not to come in judgment at this particular time. Now he will come again. It's going to look a lot different because there will be judgment on the second coming, but Christ used his wisdom and his prudence to push mankind forward. And that was a beautiful example of it. Thank you. All right, Sister Joe. He was with that group. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we was together. All right, so one more group over here. All right, well, Joshua. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, I, we was, what we was discussing was about one thing about God's wisdom, like who can explain the vast wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, it's just like the fact that he led by example being here and everything that he did, his wisdom, he was showing just basically he's a human like everybody else. I got desires like everybody else. You can live a holier life. You don't have to live a corner life. You can live a holier life. I can show you this. And then every time he did it, his craftiness was in the fact that he could always tell you this is how you can do this this is how you can earn the kingdoms the uh, the way to the kingdom of heaven or the way to righteousness or the way to wisdom you know he always give you an example after he's just like what brother was saying over here he always give you an example about the things that you were you were doing or that you could be doing and that you shouldn't be doing and how you can attain that type of wisdom and glory and craftiness in the spirit yeah beautiful example just christ coming down himself and the fact that he was at all points tempted just like we are. There's some wisdom involved in that. That way mankind can be without excuse. Christ could have used superpowers, the, the God's superpowers in so many scenarios, but instead he said, I'm going to show you that this can be done in the flesh. Prudence, his whole example. So that was beautiful. Did I miss anybody? Did I miss any groups? All right, I think we got everybody. So thank you all. This was beautiful. This is a beautiful example. And I hope that you can see how important it is, because as we add to our wisdom, prudence. So when we go forward, we're not going to just look for wisdom in this life, but we're going to look for the skill to be successful here. You're going to need skill to be successful in your marriage. You're going to need skill to be successful in ministry. You need skill to be successful in raising children. You need skill to be successful in just interpersonal relationships as we deal with one another. But we're going to bring along with our skill a little bit of prudence. The ability to do things sometimes in an uncommon way. Sometimes people may not necessarily understand it at first sight, just like they didn't understand Jesus' ministry at first sight. But you have to exercise that prudence anyway and understand that just because they can't see the result doesn't mean that it's not there. Everybody looked at David like he was foolish, going out there with a staff against the giants, Goliath. He looked foolish, but he exercised prudence that came from God. Everybody looked at Christ like he was foolish, coming out of this little small Nazarene tribe, made himself of no reputation, allowed himself to be killed, this foolishness of preaching that saves mankind even down here today. God has always used what appears to be foolish in the sight of men. But we're not fools, and we understand that we have spiritual insight because we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith, which is the next weapon we're gonna talk about. Mastering your weapon of faith. Faith goes right along with wisdom and prudence, and we have to have this if we're gonna be successful in spiritual warfare. So when we go back to David's example, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 47, he says, All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. That is what you guys can see with your own eyes. Saul wants me to go fight this battle with a sword and with his armor. Goliath wants to come at me with his spear and with his armor. Everybody around is saying that I should use this kind of stuff, but it's not the sword or the spear. It's not where my victory is. The battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. How in the world can David, the little shepherd boy, who's never swung a sword in his life, he's never been to war, he's never been engaged in any kind of battle outside of guarding and defending sheep. How's he gonna have the gall to step up and say, 
that the battle's not won with the sword or the spear. In every battle you've ever seen, it's been won with a sword or a spear. What is this shepherd boy talking about? He looks foolish, but he's using faith. How does he have the confidence to say that God will give the Philistines into our hands? Where does that confidence stem from? You can shout it out. How does David have this confidence? Faith. Faith in what? Faith in who? Faith in God. Faith in God's promises. Faith in God's promises. He continuously says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, this uncircumcised Philistine. How is he going to defy the armies of God? Where does he get his authority from? To come up talking greasy to us like we the underdog. I'm sorry, street talk came out a little bit. All right. So how is he going to come around talking, right, talking all this smack like he's supposed to be some sort of big person? Did you guys forget that you are the chosen people of God? While y'all are cowering in fear, did you forget who you belong to? It took the shepherd boy to come up with this level of confidence. He says he's going to give us all of these people into our hands, not because of us, but because of his promise. My faith being built in God's promise is how I get the victory in this life. Let's take a look at another example. Daniel 3, 15 through 18, familiar story. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, getting ready to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Big bad Nebuchadnezzar, and he is big bad Nebuchadnezzar, by the way. Babylon is the most powerful empire on planet Earth at this time. He is the king and the sovereign ruler of this empire. Everybody does what Nebuchadnezzar says. Now, where did these three little Hebrew boys get the nerve and the gall to step up and say, no, we're not going to worship this statue? Just like the shepherd boy David, you must be out of your mind to stand up to this kind of authority. But what does he say? And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? That's the question that Nebuchadnezzar posed. The answer says, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Just to answer your question, but even if he doesn't, let it be known that we will not serve your gods and we're not going to bow down to your image. The three Hebrew boys did not forget who they belonged to, even though they were in the midst of persecution and captivity, and God was angry with that nation at that time, which is why they're serving Babylon in the first place. Israel is in captivity, but while God is angry with them, it does not negate his promises. When God makes a promise to you, even in the midst of your own sin, and even in your season of chastisement, God might be beating you upside the head and trying to correct you, just slapping you on the behind, trying to get you back on the right path. And you feel the discipline in your life and you feel the heartache and the tension and you feel that something that you're going through and God is trying to show you something. But even in the midst of that season, his promises are not null and void. They remain valid. God's promises always remain valid. And even in the midst of persecution, the three Hebrew boys had faith enough to see it. Faith from David, faith from the three Hebrew boys, and of course we can always go to our master, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who had faith when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, despite all the things that he was getting ready to face, did not forget about God's promises. He will not allow me to be corrupt. He will not leave me in the grave. That was the promise, and Christ trusted in it. What kind of faith are we working with tonight? This is a key question we have to ask. It is an absolute non-starter in spiritual warfare if you can't generate enough faith to trust in the one who's going to win your battles for you. Because I got to tell you, you come out here with your own strength and your own game plan, and your own will, if you want to, you better trust in the one who said he was going to give you the victory. And that's where we're going to stand. But we got to be able to discern the difference because we want to know, are we using faith or are we using presumption? Are we trusting God or are we being foolish? 
there is a way that seems right unto man that leads us into death. And if we don't have discernment to be able to see the difference, it can lead us into destruction. This is a gotcha. <laughs> this is one of those gotchas in life because Satan will often try to twist things. We know what he does, right? He corrupts. That's what he does. He takes God's purity and he always seeks to corrupt it. So sometimes we can be in this faith movement and we can call faith something that is not because we can be foolish. And we don't want to fall into that trap either, which is why I'm talking about this. I'm going to name it and claim it and say that God's going to deliver me from this. Did God ever make that promise, though? I'm going to name and claim I've been single for the last 40 years and God's going to bring me a spouse. Maybe. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. Did he promise you a spouse? I mean, look, real talk, real talk. I'm, I'm telling you. We got to be, we can trust in God. We got to have our faith in God, but we got to rely on his promises that he actually said. So when it comes down to me being secure in my salvation, if I follow his statutes and I keep his commandments and I'm obedient to him and he promises that he will deliver me from this life into the next life, yeah, I can keep my hope and faith and trust in that one. I can take that one to the bank because it's going to cash. That promise came from God. Now you pray for your job interviews. You pray for your spouse if you're looking for one. You pray for your situations in life and ask God to give them to you, ask him to shower favor upon you all day long. But you gotta understand where your promises are. That's what you put your hope, your faith, and your trust in. You take those to the bank. You're not gonna know the difference if you don't get in the word. If you don't see what he says, you don't know what to hold him accountable for. You ever think about that? We can hold God accountable. You remember in Malachi where he says, test me in this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and see what I won't do? God doesn't mind you holding him accountable to the things that he says when he says it. We have the right to do it. He invites us <laughs> to do it. Just make sure that you do it where he said he was going to do it, not where you want him to do it. <laughs> That's the wisdom we got to add to this scenario. Hebrews 11 one says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Of course, probably read this a hundred times. When Hebrews, right, there's, there's so much insight in here because when we start talking about substance, and that's really what I just got off of, take a look at the floor underneath you right now. I'm standing on carpet. A lot of you are standing on vinyl. Do you know that there's vinyl flooring, right? Substance. Sub means below and stance is something that you can Take a stance on. This is what faith is for us. But while you stand on vinyl or on carpet, just understand it's not the vinyl or the carpet that's keeping you up. Underneath this uh, beautiful layer is something called the subfloor. And that's what the substance really is. It's concrete. We are on concrete. Concrete is the substance. I can have complete confidence that I could stand here, I could jump up and down, and that this floor will support me. Y'all are sitting on these pews and you have confidence that they won't collapse because they're on a subfloor. But what you see here, you don't see the subfloor, do you? You don't, you don't see the concrete that's actually holding you up. You see the pretty layer. If I were to take this vinyl and you just put it up and you held it and it wasn't on the floor, the moment you step onto it, you're going down. You're going to crash. Why? The vinyl layer is not strong enough to support your weight. So many people look at celebrities and other people in our society, influencers, all of these lives, and all you see is the pretty stuff. That is not substance. That's just the pretty layer. If this carpet is not on the concrete, when you stand on it, you will collapse. And many of us are taking a look at so many people's lives that are not built on anything solid, but it looks flashy because they can drive fancy things and they can say fancy stuff and they look all good on TV, but at the end, if you pull back their private lives, you will see that many of them are in abject poverty because there's no substance. 
you have Christ. That's the concrete. Even if it doesn't look like the prettiest layer, your life is solid. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is... All right. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for the one who comes must believe that he exists and that he proves to be the one who rewards the ones that diligently seek him. That's where David got his confidence from. David believed that God not only was, but that God will reward him. The three Hebrew boys not only believed in God, but believed that their faithfulness, God would reward them. So what do we stand tonight in our belief in God's reward system? I would venture to say that all of you in this auditorium tonight believe that he is. The key question is, do you believe that he will reward you if you seek him? That's a different level. The skill in believing, there's prudence in believing that he's going to actually fulfill his promises. Your question to meditate on this week, how different will your life look if you believe and you actually start believing that God will reward you for seeking him? I'm talking about if you believed it to the point to where you start executing on it, to the way you start living in that truth. If I seek the kingdom first, he's actually going to add the things that I need. Believe it and execute on it. Not just say it, not just in theory, but in practice. How different will your marriage look? How different will your life look? How different will your career look? How different will your health look? Everything that you want in this life, how different will it look when you actually start believing that God's going to fulfill his promises? So think about that. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come to you at this time just giving thanks, Father, for continuing to watch over us, continuing to be the God who keeps us, you give us your wisdom, you give us the ability to exercise prudence, and you give us faith. Father, help us to strengthen our faith that we become so convinced in your promises that we start living out this life in the way that we start to look more like your son, Jesus Christ. He ultimately believed in everything that you said. He continually said, not my will, but my Father's will, and he walked according to your promises, even though it led him to a cross. If this life leads us to a cross, let us never neglect your promises. Never, let us never neglect your faith and always be believers in the reward that you have for us. Help us, Father, to be like Christ. In his holy name, amen.